Good afternoon. Okay, my name is Richard Trimble. I teach at Ocean County College uh, and at Kane. Uh, frankly, it's the start of my 46th year of teaching. Okay, it's been in a classroom a long time and uh, loved every minute. Do it all over again in a heartbeat. I'm kind of semi-retired now. I have about three classes I teach at both colleges, but uh, history has been my gig the whole time. Okay, and I think uh, really in the second half of my career, from the last 30 years, uh, I've been um, kind of getting more into historical novels. Okay, I. I, I think they're, they're good from a lot of perspectives. One, they're livelier reads than your traditional history textbook or history uh, scholarly work, okay? All right. uh, secondly, they paint great images for kids, okay, in the minds of their, in their minds, and um, they'll, they'll get a deeper understanding and a richer uh, sense of who a Robert E. Lee was if they read The Killer Angels, for example, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a Ulysses Grant, okay, from reading the Gingrich Forstian novels, okay, I'll talk more about them in detail later on. So it, it really is, it really is a rich way of teaching history. Now, you got to be careful with it a little bit, because sometimes the authors will stretch the truth, okay, but it, uh, it, it does doesn't mean that they should be discarded, okay? I've used historical novels now uh, fairly well in class and I enjoy doing it. So, with that being said, in any historical novel, there's three things I look for, okay? I'm looking for, um, basically, does the, has the author done the research, okay? In other words, have they done, do they know what the historical climate was at the time? What people are thinking? What's happening? What they're saying, okay? Obviously, not knowing what they're saying, but you can put words in the, in the mouth of your character, which leads me to my second point. Bring the characters to life. Bring Robert E. Lee to life. Bring George Washington to life. Get into his head, okay? So, do the proper historical research. Bring the character to life. And this last one is a personal one. I like short chapters, okay? Because the pace of the book moves so much quicker, quicker then, all right? Short little snippet chapters five pages, three pages. No more than 10. If you pick up a book like Gone with the Wind, which is an historical novel, okay, or a uh, uh, War and Peace, which is an historical novel, okay, the chapters are tedious. They are so long. But that's the old style, the way they did it, okay, the way they wrote them back in those days. So having said that, I do think that modern historical novels, the genre has changed a little bit over the years, okay? One of them, uh, if you go with those two si examples I cited, Going with the Wind and, uh, and uh, War and Peace, um, I'm a little reluctant to have kids read them today because they not many times aren't rooted with enough historical research, but also, too, they're tough to read. Now, Okay, and if we've got young students at a junior college, and particularly in high school, and I did teach high school for some 38 years while I was teaching as a, as a college professor, um, we can turn them off to history, and I want to turn them on to history. So I want to have them read that good historical novel written by a, a more current author, okay, who's appealing to a more current audience, all right? So I know it sounds anathema, but frankly, War and Peace, well, it is on my Russian history reading list, okay? But the Gone with the Wind is not, neither is Uncle Tom's Cabin. I've read them. We have to read them as history teachers, okay? But not necessarily assign them to our students. Later on, those students become more mature readers. Maybe they want to pick that work up, become a history teacher. They certainly should pick that up. But when you're starting out and germinating that, that passion for history, I think that the, uh, the more current writers are the ones to go with, the more lively readings and things like that. So, um, inevitably, you know, what are some of my favorites, okay? Well, I got to start off with, uh, with one that uh, won the Pulitzer Prize, it was like mid-70s that won it, and that's Michael Shiraz's famous book, The Killer Angels, about the Battle of Gettysburg. You pick up that, it'll grab you from page one, okay? All right, um, he puts you in the minds of the characters so well, all right, that I remember reading one review in which a Southern writer said, how dare Mr. Shira put words in the mouth of Mars Lee, okay, all right? As if he's a godlike figure that you couldn't put words in the mouth of, okay? But that's what, made, that's what brought it to life, okay? You saw his passion, his thought process, and everything else like this. I have uh, taken my kids out to Gettysburg, and I've given them Killer Angels tours. We'll trace the book at different parts of the battlefield and things like that. Done that, it's kind of interesting. Now, his son Jeff Shira took over after his father passed on. And Jeff Shiraz, New Jersey kid, born in New Brunswick, okay, he is a prolific writer. 
He, his first book that came out was Gods and Generals, and it, he tried to imitate his father's style, and it didn't work for him, right? But he learned after that, okay, and then put in the third wing of the trilogy. Picture this, Killer Angels, Gettysburg, Gods and Generals, the 1861-62 years, and then his last one, the last full measure in that trilogy, okay, uh, was just outstanding. He did his own way, did his own thing, carved his own path. Uh, great, great book. So what's he written? He's written a trilogy on the, the war in the East, a trilogy in a war in the West, and by the way, his book on Vicksburg, okay, which is called um, Chain of Thunder, outstanding, okay, all right, on the Battle of Vicksburg. He's written a trilogy on the uh, on World War II, okay. He's written a, 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 a two-volume study on the American Revolution, Rise to Rebellion and Glorious Cause. I can't recommend highly enough. They're great. A kid can pick up those books, get turned on to history, and learn about the American Revolution in no uncertain terms. In fact, he brought up something that I used in class that I didn't know about, okay, with regarding Washington's escape from New York City after the invasion of Manhattan and things like that. I didn't even know about that, all right? He wrote it in his book, I checked it out, and said, dead on accurate. Okay, so he's done his research. Now, the Shiraz are great, no question at all. I've read every one of their books. He's been, uh, Jeff Shiraz has been a little quiet lately, so I don't know what he's working on now, okay? But uh, I tried to get him to speak to one of my groups, the uh, Jersey Shore Civil War Roundtable. i got to give it a plug. Or the uh, uh, my history clubs that I've run in different cool schools where I've taught. But um, uh, you got to go through the publisher, and he's big bucks. So I haven't brought him into class, but uh, certainly his work I have, okay? And he's, he's good. He's good. So um, who else? Ken Follett, British writer, okay, all right, wrote a two-volume history in the Middle Ages, historical novel. They're long, but when you get a long historical novel, you don't want to put it down and you don't want it to end, okay, all right? Uh, Pillars of the Earth, I forget the other one he wrote. I mean, they're great. They're great. They just pull you into the story, okay? Then he tackled a three-volume history of the early 20th century. Okay, starts it off with the years just before World War One and concludes with the Cold War years. I liked it. I read all three. I was drawn into them. But I'm going to be honest with you, got a little trashy in some of those things. So in other words, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to almost recommend them to students. So uh, at any rate, Ken Follett, just, you know, obviously another great writer that uh, can write. He's only gotten really into historical novels lately. He used to write spy novels, Eye of the Needle and things like that. Okay, but um, at any rate, his historical novels are good particularly those two on the Middle Ages, okay? I, I, the same, the second one escapes me, but the first one is Pillars of the Earth. Now, I'm going to give you another one. Clive Custer. Uh, Clive Custer doesn't do his homework, okay? His novels are wild, okay? Not rooted in a lot of historical research, but they're fun to read. They're the ones I call the beach reads, okay? They're the ones that you bring to the beach, and uh, uh, if you, the, <laughs> the bookmark blows off somewhere, okay, you can always pick up the story, all right? Uh, his stuff is fun. But it is far-fetched. For example, his book Sahara uh, dealt with the Merrimack, the CSS Virginia, okay, from the fame, modern Merrimack fame, uh, ended up loaded with gold, sailing the Atlantic, and ends up being embedded in the Sahara Desert, okay? Uh, he wrote another one called Inca Gold, in which uh, Sir Francis Drake and the treasure fleets and things like that uh, end up being uh, uh, caught up in a mountain, whether because of a typhoon wave, a tidal wave, caught up on a mountain among the, Appala uh, among the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Andes, all right? Um, he wrote one about a Japanese submarine loaded with anthrax torpedoes was going to hit uh, uh, the shores at Hawaii. So they're fun. They're wild, but they're fun. And they're not rooted in a lot of historical research, okay? But Clive Cox was another one you could pick up. He's not on my reading list because there's not enough homework on it. But uh, still, I do like reading him. I don't mind that. And I've only read about three of his work. Um, all right. I mean, give me some of the titles and things that I like and my philosophy about this stuff, okay? Uh, the, uh, let me give some stuff on kind of recently discovered and everything else like that. Um, I like naval history, okay, I always have. And uh, this is a guy, S. Thomas Russell. I first picked up one of his books at a used book sale, okay, and um, uh, it was called A Battle One. I liked it, all right? And then I found it was part of a trilogy. 
Here's the third volume called Under Enemy Colors, okay? And he writes about naval history in the Napoleonic War, the Age of Sail. I highly recommend him. He's done his homework. His characters are just striking, okay? Particularly the captain he deals with here and things like that. Fighting the French, etc. Kind of like a... Horatio Hornblower type of story here, okay? But I like his stuff. So S. Thomas Russell, okay, his naval histories in the War of 1812. Now, there's another guy out there that writes this, okay, uh, the, in terms of the historical novels about the naval history in the, in the Napoleonic Wars, and we're looking at Patrick O'Brien. The only problem I have with Patrick O'Brien is he's so technical, okay, all right? Uh, he obviously has done his homework, no question at all, but his references, the top gallant sail, the jib, the spinnaker, the boom, okay, things leeward, windward, to a guy who can't even figure out what leeward and windward is, okay, I, he loses me many times. He's so technical, believe it or not, there's a dictionary of O'Brien references that you can buy as a supplement, okay, when you're reading his historical novels, such as Master and Commander, they made a movie of that, okay, and read what he's talking about in terms of technical references. I'm not sure I want to sit down and study an historical novel like that. I often read them when I go to bed at night. And I've read a short chapter and then put it aside by the nightlight and that's it, okay? All right? I don't want to have to highlight and underline and go to a dictionary to f figure out what the author's talking about. But obviously Patrick O'Brien is one of the great names on it. But I'd recommend it. It's Thomas Russell. Now, here's another one that's out there, okay? Another two authors. One is a very famous name. You're going to recognize him immediately. Newt Gingrich who has a Ph.D. in history from Tulane, okay? So he's done his research, he knows his stuff. The guy that's really the shaker mover behind is William Forstchen. This is only one of their many books, all right? This is called To Make Men Free, and this is about, I believe, I haven't read this yet, okay? This is about uh, the Battle of the Crater, okay, and the Petersburg Campaign and the Civil War. Their stuff is very good, okay? All right? Uh, and many times with what they call counterfactual history, which I'm going to get into in a second here, all right? Um, he wrote a trill. They wrote a trilogy on George Washington, and the first one is called is on Valley Forge. Okay, the last one's on Yorktown. They are outstanding, but they're not counterfactual history. It's almost a psychological study of George Washington. What's going through his mind as he's fighting the revolution and dealing with the demoralization of the troops at uh, at. Um, at Valley Forge, will the French show up at Yorktown? He's agonizing over this. Can he can he trap the British, or will they trap him? Whatever it might be, that their stuff is good. But they get into the counterfactual genre now. What is that? I'm going to return to that in a, in a little bit here. But uh, uh, when I get into the more into counterfactual history, it's basically what if something happened that didn't happen, or vice versa. What if it didn't happen when it did, okay? I'll use a classic illustration here, okay, about a, I, I, the name of the book escapes me, but um, it's about Patrick Ferguson, who's a British major, a major in the British Army in the American Revolution, and he's invented a rifle musket that's good, capable of killing, killing range of over 300 yards. Now, normal musket range is 60, 70 yards, all right? So he's got a sniper gun is what he's got. Okay, now again, this was fairly common, but it wasn't common in the British Army. He's developed his own musket and his own platoon of men to use these muskets. At the Battle of Brandywine, and this is true, the Battle of Brandywine, he's got his musket leveled on an officer on a horse. He doesn't know who that officer is, but he can't bring himself to pull the trigger. Why? Okay, because he feels it's murder. So he doesn't pull the trigger. Well, what if he did and he kills that officer? That officer was George Washington. Does that change history if George Washington was down at the Battle of Brandywine? Okay, think about that. Just think of the whole ramifications. And authors have taken that and built historical novels on that whole thing. Uh, in my, there, there's the famous novel called For Want of a Nail, okay, in which a shoe, horseshoe is thrown from a horse's hoof for want of a nail. And the horse comes up lame. So the officer riding the horse shows up late for battle. Okay? And it goes on and on and on. What if, what if, what if, what if. Now, counterfactual history I do like, but you've got to be careful with this for students because students may not see that it's not real. Okay? All right? Now, I'm going to come back to that, but before I give you another set of stuff here that I'm also reading, 
I've never read this author before, Mary Doria Russell. I'm not all the way through this one yet. This is called Epitaph. Good one about the uh, historical novel about the gunfight at the OK Corral. Really gets into the characters. Virgil Morgan or Wyatt Earp. Okay, uh, it's good stuff. Okay, so again, another historical novel. Characters brought to life. Short chapters. Okay, so it moves good, fast pace. Okay, and she's done her research. All right, gets into the politics of Tombstone, Arizona, and everything else like that. So as I say, guys, there's a lot of good stuff out there, okay, uh, that you can really learn a lot of history from. Having said that, you got to be careful though with that counterfactual stuff. What is the title of this book by Peter Soros? Well, the Confederates didn't win a civil war. This book is outstanding. It's got ten essays from different authors on scenarios in which the South could have won the Civil War. Suppose they win at Gettysburg, okay? How does that change the war? Suppose the Merrimack continues to run a reign of terror on British and American shipping and the blockade in the Civil War. Um, suppose uh, uh, Grant is defeated at, uh, at, uh, at Vicksburg, okay? All right? Uh, there is called an alternate history of the Civil War, but you've got to warn students that it didn't happen this way. Now, I'm going to give you another author that I loved and then I, now, now I, he's fallen out of favor with me, all right? Harry Turtledove. First book I ever read by him was a book called Guns of the South. Couldn't put it down, okay? It deals with a wild scenario where a platoon of North Carolinian soldiers uh, in the Civil War, Battle of the Wilderness, get stocked with AK-47 assault rifles. <laughs> Think about the impact that would have on the Civil War. I want to get into why. It's just too wild a scenario. But the novel is great. The South goes on to Civil War and win a Civil War. Robert E. Lee becomes president of the New Confederate States of America. Okay, all right. He frees the slaves, much to the chagrin of a lot of the landowners and slave owners. All right. Well, the country comes back together again later on. And uh, kind of following the scenario of McKinley Cantor's book, If the South Had Won the Civil War. Texas secedes, they come together in World War I, that sort of thing. Counterfactual history is fun stuff. My problem with Turtle Dove, though, he's, he wants to sell books is all he wants to do. So none of his more current books, he's got a massive uh, set on World War I and World War II, World War II in particular, they don't come to any conclusion. He just wants to leave you hanging so you buy the next book. Okay, So he frustrates me. All right. He did write one on the battle of the battle of the, uh, of, of the assault on Fort Pillow, the massacre at Fort Pillow during the Civil War, uh, which wasn't counterfactual. Very good historical novel, but you got to be careful with Turtle Dove. Okay. All right. So counterfactual history in the form of Peter Soros's books, Harry Turtle Dove's books. Newt Gingrich's books. Newt Gingrich and uh, William Forston wrote a book on Pearl Harbor. I'll give you a good illustration of uh, counterfactual history. One of the things that made Pearl Harbor a strategic defeat, and it was a tactical victory by the Japanese, but a strategic defeat, okay, was that Admiral Nagumo decided not to launch the third wave, which would have taken third wave planes, third attack wave, which would have taken out the entire American Pacific Fleet and destroyed uh, the American, more importantly, destroyed Pearl Harbor as a naval base. He didn't launch that third wave. He would have addressed the tank farms, the oil tank farms rather, uh, the dock facilities and everything else like that. He didn't launch that one. Why? Yamamoto wasn't there. Yamamoto who planned the operation was back in Tokyo. Now this is all, this is all true. In his book, Pearl Harbor, it follows the scenario right to uh, the, uh, the attack. But Yamamoto's there, overrides Nagumo, orders the second, the third wave, and Pearl Harbor is utterly destroyed. And the war in the Pacific changes. So guys, that kind of stuff makes for great reads. Historical novels have a role in the teaching of our history courses, all right? But as I always said, there's no book on my book list that I haven't read. Read them first. So you can prepare your students and decide which ones are the better ones to have them read. I thank you for your time.